All right, guys, welcome to the first new iteration uh, of Closes or Losers with me, Matt, and Jeremy. How you going, Jeremy? Uh, you know, Matt, I'm just hanging out. Um... I am, I'm kind of like in the holiday, you know, there's this whole season, but I'm trying to like not think about any of that stuff because it gets me like distracted, you know, and I don't want to be yeah. distracted at all. So that's kind of where I'm at. Does it make you want to like wait to do things till after Christmas or are you an action taker, Jeremy? <laughs> you know, I'm a pretty good action taker, but you don't know, yeah. like when you're driving down the road and you're listening to like Christmas songs and it's like, have a holy jolly Christmas. And you're just like, Oh man, I just want to do nothing when I get home, but sip like cider and, and sit on my couch and watch my, my, my children run around and play with toys and games. And just, it's, it's weird. So like I had to, I had to turn off the Christmas music. I have to be Scrooge until like a day or so before Christmas. And then I take the time off. Otherwise I get distracted, you know? Yeah, exactly, man. And you gotta, you know, go to those mansions, you know, the, the property taxes and you gotta get after it, dude. It's <laughs> It's all. We only, yeah. Hey, we only have three, dude. We had to downsize, man. We had to downsize. <laughs> oh, well. Oh, well. We'll have to get back up there. I'll take that as a personal affront to me. Um, okay. So what we're going to talk about today is this is like closes or losers still going on business as usual, but we're going to add on um, an episode per week of me and Jeremy uh, shooting the shit yeah. and talking about all things sales, sales industry, yeah. You know, we obviously come at things from slightly different angles, being different people. Also, I've, sure. most of my experience is coaching and consulting, and most of Jeremy's experience is literally everything else. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's a good combo. It's a good problem to have. Exactly, exactly. So today, what I wanted to talk about is, um, what I wanted to ask you about is, like, I actually just did a video of a review of one of Grant Cardone's uh, sales calls, and it was super interesting. But I'd love to get your opinion on, like, technical because i suppose there's people who are really good at sales but they're not really good at sales but they get a lot of sales and they get it through like pure force of will and then there's people who are like just technically very very gifted at persuasion mm. and i think like there's a spectrum there and both can be super successful in the world of sales obviously grant cardone has a plane with his logo on the side so there's no arguing the level of success but yeah. Like I would say personally, like I think he's an absolute hammer of a yeah. human being who just yeah. through sheer force of will and conviction gets people over the line. Yeah. But is that can translatable? I, can, I, can I make yeah. a suggestion about your comment there? Yeah. So I, I, I think Cardone is awesome. I, I love his motivational stuff. In fact, I've read several of his books. However, if I put, if I said, look, if I'm a sales manager, and I hired Grant Cardone to sell whatever my product or services are right now. And Grant used the sales techniques that he, I'm just gonna be very blunt. He used yeah. the sales techniques that are taught in his Cardone University. He would not be a top salesperson at all. Here's, what, here's one thing that people don't understand. When, when Grant and some of these gurus were selling, we're talking 30, 40 plus years ago, okay? The consumer was completely different. OK, we now live in an age what we call the information age buyer, right? The consumer, because of the Internet, uh, you, you know, the power of the Internet, social media, they know they have many choices to choose the exact product or service that you sell. 20 plus years ago is a lot different. 30 years ago, you know, 40, 40 years ago in the 80s when they sold on the opportunity, you know, like Wolf on Wall Street. Hey, I've got an opportunity for you. That type of stuff doesn't work anymore, especially if you're in a more of a complex selling environment. If I came in and- What would you consider a complex selling environment? Anything that's over $1,000, 100%. Okay. 100%. Anything over $1,000, 2,000, 5,000. I mean, really complex selling is probably, you know, something that's more B2B or B2C, but like high ticket. You use yeah. those type of old school closing techniques. It is absolutely going to trigger sales resistance automatically. Now you can be a beast and pull some people over the field, but I guarantee you, you use those type of techniques uh, compared to what to, to what we teach you as far as the new model of selling. Those salespeople are going to make laps around those type of people that make those that use those old type of techniques. So what I'm trying to suggest is 
motivation is great. That stuff is great. It worked well for him 30, 40 years ago when he was actually selling one-on-one. But if he was selling one-on-one like products or services now, there's no way, no way. Uh, you'd get laughed out of a boardroom using those type of closing techniques. If people just laugh at you, and like, kick your kick your ass out. That's my opinion. Yeah, yeah, no, it, it's funny. Like you know, Marco, right? Obviously, like one of our, or it's like a top sales dude. So yeah. I don't know if you, know, I don't know if you know his whole story. So he actually came over from Italy to sell for Cardone. He was the top cold calling book salesman. Yeah. Um, and he, he like, so he's friends with like Jordan Spieth and all the guys. So he actually gets hit up uh, like once a month to go work for Cardone. Right. That's um, yeah. And, and, and it's, and it's really funny because he was like, there is no greater, like the environment there for sales is like, there is no like more motivating environment. And I was like, yeah, like it, it, it makes, it makes total sense. And I think that's why, like, obviously a lot of the sales they do are like, probably not the huge B2B deals. I would say a lot of them are probably more like, you know, 10 stuff. Transactional. You know I mean? It's transactional selling. It's cars. It's everything below. Yeah, exactly. And so I think, but that's why like, and they just, they just go in and what we call Cardone smash and they just absolutely annihilate people <laughs> into doing it, which I can see like, because that's where I came from in sales and it's really fun. Like it's when you get in that environment, because that's like when I was running the gyms, that's the environment that I was in. It was yeah. like smash, grab, like call the prospects, idiots, the whole box and dice. Like, ah, I sold this moron. Like, it's a terrible, terrible thing. But when you get into it, like, yeah. it's such a hard thing to get out of. And I, I didn't get out of it until I met, yeah. until I started your way. And I started to see like the actual benefits of, of not treating people like garbage. <laughs> Well, it's, it's, it's the same thing. I mean, and Cardone, don't get me wrong. Like, no insult to him. I think his stuff is amazing, like motivational stuff. Just, I think he's one of the best motivators out there. You know, I, I put him in a different way than Tony Robbins. I think Tony Robbins, like psychologically, internally motivates somebody to make lasting changes. That's what I noticed from his material. I think Cardone is more external, like pump you up. So you got to hear it like every single day to keep going. Uh, but just like Marco, just like you, once you started learning EPQ and, and learning how to sell that way, you know, hell, what happened? You know, big, big time. It's like explosion. It's like a completely different way of thinking. Selling went from adversarial, where it's you against the customer, right? Like you moron, yeah, yeah. or I'm going to take the money from them. They've got my money. To now yeah, it's yeah. more collaborative where we're working together with the prospect to help them find problems they didn't even think they had. And we're helping them solve those. So they view us more as the you know, the authority figure, the expert, rather than trying to get rid of us, you know, it's a completely different way of thinking, but completely different result. Yeah. And I guess the flip side of that coin is, is Belfort, right? Yeah. Now yeah. I probably, I might have a different opinion. I think although Belfort's techniques are like in the Wolf of Wall Street, like I've, I've done his straight line persuasion. I think there's a lot of really good stuff in there, especially yeah. like, I love his looping technique. I yeah. think he's like an extremely good persuader very yeah. technically proficient salesperson who knows how to communicate. Um, mm. But like his methods were developed in a time that were absolutely morally bankrupt. Yeah. And so, like, <laughs> and so, but there's a lot of good stuff. Like, like I consider myself like the best part of my sales game is objection handling, yeah. like for sure. And I tell people like, that's because I'm not good enough at selling. Like, I'm like, that's, that's the reason. Like if I was as good as you are at selling, I wouldn't have to be so good at objection handling. Right. So like that that's all, prevention. Yeah. But like, I haven't got there yet. You know, I've only been like, you know, I'm still learning. Like I haven't been selling for that long in terms of Me like too. high, like high ticket. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so, but I think like Belfort stuff, like I was a real big, it was really interesting. I don't know if you watched the podcast with him and Cardone and it was super interesting watching yeah. two like, totally different styles of communicating the amount of outs that Belfort gave him because he is a good communicator to like to, to allow Cardone to work back and he just didn't see any of them it well, was amazing it's, it's, yeah I mean Jordan has like a sales process now I might not I might say like hey this sales process is for some good aspects of it do I think it would it would work that well in today's more complex selling environment I don't but it's a sales process it's like a to B to C to Z. Cardone was like, is just all over the place, right? So of course, if you're using Jordans, you're, in my opinion, you're gonna convert higher 
than you would grants just because it's a step-by-step sales process that's more duplicatable, right? That, it's not yeah. just about you learning how to sell that way. It's how do you teach your sales teams how to sell that way? And most people don't have Cardone's smash em personality or Jordan's smash em personality, persuader personality. That's like 5% of your salespeople. The other 95% don't have that. In fact, they're very uncomfortable trying to sell like that. So with what we teach here, it's duplicatable for any type of personality. In fact, I would say the five percenters, we almost have to like brainwash them or unbrainwash them about how they view selling as more adversarial rather than collaborative. But I would say uh, when I watched that, you could definitely see that Jordan was giving him a lot of like help and just Grant, I don't know where Grant was. That was just my thoughts. Yeah, it's funny you say that because Marco was the last adopter of NEPQ in the whole team. Yeah. Was he really? What because, tell me about what happened. Well, he just didn't want to do it. Um, yeah. He was, because I mean, what he was doing was working. So you got to remember, like me and Marco, like we come from like a proper smash and grab background. Like we yeah. were selling $97 fitness offers and we were like, we need to close this in 12 minutes. Right? Sure, yeah, 97 bucks like, is transactional. Hey, hey, hey. Yeah. You know, just back and back, you know, and then uh, so we would just do that and we would close hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of sales every single month. Yeah. And then so when we transitioned, like it wasn't it was only like 18 months ago, we were still selling. So we were selling 18 months ago. I was selling like like one hundred and ninety seven dollar, ninety seven dollar fitness programs. I didn't do my first high ticket sale until September of twenty nineteen. Wow. That's incredible. Right. And so. um and uh, and then it was like around May of 20, no, March of 2020 that I met you. Yeah. And so it hasn't been that long, but um, Marco was doing fairly well for some of the high, small, high, smaller, like high ticket clients that we had. Yeah. Um, and, and then like he was so adverse because he just thought he was going to lose his authority and all this kind of stuff. And it was like, no. So then what we did is we just started tinkering with his triage, with like the, with like the discovery call, then because he had a terrible show up, rate, It was like 30% show up to his sales goal. He's constantly oh, having no shows. Scared them all off. Yeah. Yeah. Had a huge pull out rate, had a huge refund rate. Cause he was just, I mean, <laughs> I'll send you some of the old calls. They were just <laughs> obliterations. Um, Dude, that's crazy. You know, but, yeah. And then, and then it was like, okay. So then when I fixed his discovery call or triage, whatever you want to call it, then we started getting like a really high show up rate to the sales goal. And then I started like tweaking tiny little things at a time. And then he's like, oh, okay. And now he's like, he's like oh, down he's, the line. Oh, he's all APQ. APQ now, man. Yeah, exactly. So it's really it's interesting like, though, but it's like that 5% because he's always a top performer. Like he was one of Grant's top performers. He was like our previous business, like the the gyms, he was a top performer. And now here he's a top performer. He's just that guy. But he was, yeah, really, really difficult to to get to switch over. Whereas some of the other guys, they, they kind of saw it straight away and they just did what I told them to do. And then they yeah, were well, way look, more look successful. Conversion rates now, hardly any refunds, show up rates massive. And his selling conversions, I would say, probably are more than twice as high, if not higher, from what I from what I understand from him. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, he was probably doing like sixty percent before. Now he's easily doing like over like over ninety. And that's not offers made. That's just like people who turn up on a phone call. Like mm-hmm. nine out of ten will buy, which is yeah. crazy. Which is crazy. <laughs> uh, the Italian stallion. Um, well, yeah. When you get when you get eight or nine out of ten to buy, then nobody wants a refund. That's when you know you're doing it right because it's collaborative, right? They feel like Marco is there to help them solve their problems, not there to sell something and stuff something down their throat. Exactly. Which segues nicely into why did you call the show Closers or Losers? You know, I you know, I really wanted to slap people in the face, and I thought that would stand out. I'm like, you know, <laughs> me too. It, I like you know, people are like, they're like, what? I'm a closer. I'm not a loser. I make two hundred thousand a year. I make three hundred thousand a year. One hundred fifty grand a year. Like, I'm I'm the best ever, and I'm a closer. Like everybody, everybody's a closer, right? There's like all these new sales training programs I see, like the you know the the inbound closer the outbound closer the sideway closers it's like the upside down closer like everybody's a freaking closer so i'm like you know what i never viewed myself as a closer i, I always like literally the, the where i came up with that word problem finder is one day about 15 years ago my boss came in and said dude how are you like outselling everybody 5 to 1 you're getting the same amount of leads you're working less hours i hear your calls how the hell are you doing it? You're five to one over everybody else. 
And I said, you know, simple. I'm just, I help people find problems they didn't think they had. And he's like, a problem finder. He's like, we're going to write that on the board. And that's where I came up with problem finder. So I view myself as a problem finder, like legitly and problem solver. I don't view myself as a closer. Okay. So I view myself as like, look, they booked this call or I'm calling this person because I know they have problems. Okay. And so closers are losers. It doesn't mean if you're closing sales, you're obviously a loser. Of course it doesn't mean that. I mean, when I was in sales, right, I made close to $3 million a year straight commission, almost 12 years straight, about 11 years straight. Obviously I closed a lot of sales, right? But I didn't use old school sales techniques that don't work. So closers are losers means that if you're still using old school sales techniques and closing techniques from the dinosaur ages of selling, which probably 90% of salespeople still do, probably 95%, I would say, you are literally losing sales that you could be making. So I don't want you to be a loser. I don't want you to lose those sales. I want you to make as many sales as possible. That's what closers or losers means. Yeah, but you don't mean the closers in black, right? You don't mean them. <laughs> What's that? Stan Locks in a circle program. What's his call? The, the closers in black. How dare you, Jeremy? Closers in black. Yeah, because they wear black suits. Yeah. Oh, okay. So they're they're the the closers in black. That's yeah. Cool. Do you know Do you know I made his do not associate with list last week? How did you do that? What happened? I don't know. I guess I'm just just too good. <laughs> so did you, did I you think talk it's because man on a podcast. Did you talk about him? Or no, something? I wish. Oh, I talked about him in a YouTube video. Um, okay. But it wasn't that unflattering. I just sort of said like what I think Dan Locke did right because it's kind of like he had this like meteoric hockey stick like rise, and I think mm -hmm. what he did was actually very genius. I think it was a little bit like borderline on the ethics side of things, but like from a pure business standpoint, if you look at what he did, it was really really clever. Like he did so much content that by the time anyone figured out what he was doing, he was eight hundred videos ahead of everybody, right? And his, and his and his content was was like from a production value really high. Um, he stole most of I would say like he stole most of his ideas from other YouTube videos, which was one of the problems. But or he was I, I'll see I'll re, he was heavily inspired by, right? <laughs> I'll say heavily that. inspired um, by. Yeah, yeah. Um, Almost word for word. Yeah, and then like, but and then he had this program, and like the dude is a like he's got to be one of the best sellers from stage that there is on the planet. Yeah. So like I, I heard stories because, you know, Will, Will was like one of Dan Locke's first guys, right? Like okay. he was one of his disciples. In black. Yeah. yeah, he had the Sifu. I don't know if you know, but Dan calls himself the Sifu, right? I had no so idea. He, he basically made like a, it's definitely not a cult. I'll put it that way, right? Um, and, uh, but it was genius. And so he had a $2,500 program, which basically just te teaches you like how to sell. And it's like every single old school selling book condensed into like, it's like Zig Ziglar's book and, you know, spin selling and like just a bunch of like it's, it's decent sales. Yeah. From what I heard is just consultative selling. Like what keeps you yeah. awake at night? Just old school stuff. Yeah, exactly. But it's just like sales 101, like old school selling 101. And so it's like for 2,500 bucks, it's probably not, it's, it's worth it. Right. Like it, it sure. gets you, you know, but the dream that was being sold was quit your nine to five, make six figures. It's like, well, yeah. it's not, no, it's not going to happen. Right. Um, and and so and then he did a he did from there he upsold on stage what's called closers in black, and he had like seven hundred people in a room and he sold like six hundred and fifty of them. Really, what price point? Uh, Twenty five thousand a year. Wow. Okay, so like right? a monthly membership or something. Yeah, and it was something crazy. Like it was, like or it was something like it was five hundred dollars a month and like five thousand dollars. It was something like that, right? Okay. I can't remember exactly what it was, but. There are stories of like people running, they literally running to the back of the room and they had all the sales guys at the back with like credit card terminals and wow. people openly weeping that they didn't have the money on the credit card to sign up there and then. Like, wow. so he must have like, I don't know what kind of wizardry he came out with um, yeah. to do that, but like obviously it didn't translate well because like Dan Locke closers are some of the worst closers that I've ever experienced. Um, he's a, he's it's a great not, salesman, he just couldn't train people how to sell. I think he's a phenomenal, well, I guess that's a big, good point. Like there's a difference between selling and pitching from stage. Yeah, there is there's a huge, huge difference, right? Like just because you're good at pitching from stage that there's almost, in my opinion, almost no translatable skills that get you good at selling one-on-one. -on -one. It's a totally different, it's a and vice versa. different sale and vice versa, a hundred percent. Yeah.
What is it that I guess like because you've done stage stuff? Uh huh. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, what would I've you say are so? What would you say are some of like the core differences? Because I've never sold from stage. Yeah. Right. So I don't. I don't pretend to know anything about it. But from what I've seen, like I can't. Like obviously, I've seen Tony Robbins pitch, and I've seen all these guys pitch on mm-hmm. stage, and like it's very impressive to be able to carry carry the yeah. room like that. And yeah. I don't think I could do it, or especially like yeah. not now, like 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 not without training. But yeah. I don't see how in any way, shape, or form that would help you sell in a one-on-one environment, especially it's, in like a, a yeah. exp- you know an expensive complex decision. It's, it's a little bit different. It's a lot about seeding. <laughs> Okay, so it's like from the very first slide that you have and certain things you say, it's how you draw your audience in. If you can get the audience to engage with you from the very first minute, just like on a cold call, it's almost like they're in hook, line, and sinker. Let me give you an example. So typically, and I took a lot of training on this from some like selling from stage experts a couple of years ago, okay? So typically when most speakers walk out on stage, even very popular speakers that get paid, you know, they get paid just to speak on stage, okay? Most of them come out and say, hey, how's it going? How's the weather? I'm so great that I'm grateful that I'm here today. Thank you so much. You know, who's here got big goals, you know, stand up. And just, it's like the blah. It's like everybody says that. So right when somebody, it's just like on a sales call, when you sound like every other person, what do people do? They zone out, right? You'll see them get on their phone. They start to look down. They go to the bathroom. So when I walked out on stage, this is just me trying to figure this out. Because when I first did my first selling from stage, this was back in like 2015. I still had my job, okay? I was like, what am I going to do? I, I got this book that was called like selling, selling secrets from the stage masters or something. It was like this old school book. And I went through it and I'm like, Oh, this would work really good. And this would work. This wouldn't work, but I could readjust it this way. And I was like, kind of like going through my own mind. Right. And so I walked out on stage, they introduce you, they play music and stuff. You walk out on the stage and I literally walked out on stage, did not say a word, complete silence. I've seen this video. Walked up to the front of the stage and I just sat there for about seven seconds. And do you know what the crowd did? They all put their phones down. They all went like this. And when I did that, when you watch that video, that was the first one I ever did, that was 1030 at night. They had me as the last speaker of the night. 1030. That's usually when you reserve like the speaker you don't know anything about who's probably the worst speaker. I never spoke like that before, okay? That was like in 2015. So that everybody's asleep basically by that point, right? Yeah. yeah. So I'm like, how do I get these people engaged? So I walked out, every I, seven seconds, complete silence. Everybody's, everybody's looking up now. I know I have their attention. And, I walk, and guess who I learned that technique from? You ever seen yeah. Wolf on Wall Street, right? At the very yeah, yeah. end, he walks out on stage. He sits there. And he looks around the room, complete silence. That's where I got it from. Thank you, Jordan Belfort. I walked down on the stage after seven seconds. I took out my, I think it was my pin. I had like this thousand dollar pin. And I did the same thing that Jordan did in that movie. That Watch the end of it. And I walked yeah, up to this pen. person and I said, what's your name? Hey, John, um, sell me this pen. And I gave it to him and then she's like, you know, the the pin is so nice. And I grabbed the pin. I did it exactly. I mimicked Leonardo on that show, mimicked him hundred percent. I grabbed it and I said, no. Then I went to the next person, like right next to him. And you can see their eyes. Like everybody's like, holy shit, is he going to ask me? And I said, (laughs) sell me this pin. I was more aggressive, right? Just like Leo does. And I gave it to him. The guy's like, uh, this pen is a nice color and it, uh, it writes very highly and it's very, and I'm like, nope, nope. And then I went to the next person over and I said, sell me this pen. And I gave it to her and she's like, blah, blah, blah. anyways. <laughs> and so that right there, like got everyone's attention. Then I brought those three people up on stage and I had them set there. And so it was like, oh shit, this is like a live interaction thing. And so I always have them set on stage with me, those three people. And I asked them, okay, so when I asked you to sell me this pen and you started talking about it, the features and benefits, how did that make you feel inside? And so I automatically get buy-in because people are like, oh shit. So when you do that at the very beginning and you get people just to completely put their phones down, not say, put your phones down, uh, you know, pay attention to me because that's just coming from you. 
But what I just did there psychologically got everybody to automatically want to do it because they were so curious that it, their brain forced them to want to engage. So it's all how you start that. And then when you go through your slides and you're talking, it's like the questions you're asking. And about 60% of the time, I'm down in the audience walking around talking. So it's like, and I'll, you know, I'll run into somebody, I'll tap somebody on their shoulder. It's not about, if you're up on stage the whole time, people will start to zone out. But when you walk down on the stage and you're starting talking and, and you'll go through the slides and blah, 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 blah. And then you ask this person this question, it forces engagement the only way you can, whether it's one-on-one. -on -one. So it's, it's those, I mean, there's a lot more that you can do on this. I've taken a bunch of courses on it, but it's, it's just about getting that engagement from the very beginning and keeping them engaged throughout the whole time. And then it's like where you show your testimonials at in that slide deck, the presentation and like what type, and you do it for specific reasons. So I know that selling sales training, there's going to be certain amount of objections. I don't have the time to learn this new type of sales training. That's an objection. I don't have the money for this. That's an objection. Um, uh, you know, will my boss let me do this? That's an objection or whatever it is, right? So in the testimonials, I would purposely yeah. put, did you see how I've done that? I would purposely yeah. put the objection. Well, you know, this one guy, you know, Brian came up to me at the end of this event. I'd show a picture of Brian, you know, like this weird looking dude, you know? And he said, you know, Jeremy, I really want to get started here, but I just don't have the money to do this. And so we went away and just, it never got started. Then three months later, Brian was at another event that I was, that I was, I was training at. And he came up to me and said, man, I really want to do this, but I don't have the money. And I said, I said, Brian, so if the last three months, how much money did you lose and lost commissions because you still haven't learned the right skills to sell more, whatever I said, right? And so Brian got enrolled and then three months later, this is what he said, and this was his testimonial. So like that, you, cause you can't resolve that concern one-on-one -on, -one on stage. So you have to put it in testimonials and have the testimonial person resolve that concern for you. And so yeah. when you do that, you're gonna sell more, you're gonna convert much more on stage. Yeah, I love it. And yeah, I think there's, it's such a huge, like it's almost like the principles are the same, but how you go about it are completely different. Oh, for sure. Because yeah. you know you want to pre-handle those objections in a one-on-one -on -one call as well. I, I use I love selling selling salespeople is like the best. Why I is that? Why do you think that? I just think you can mess with them, like <laughs> you. Can, but it becomes really productive. So like I, I had like because I've obviously sold um, a bunch of the inner circle guys, um, and you know they say something. I go, can I just can I just hit the timeout button for a second? Yeah. Like what? I'm like, you know, can I just analyze your response from a pure analytical sales point of view, yeah. just for your own benefit? And they're like, yeah. And I'm like, so what do you, what do you think you just said there? They're like, oh, I said this. And I'm like, well, no, actually you gave yourself two different emotional outs. Yeah. I was like, so you answered every question, but the question that I asked and the reason why you did that was this, do you see that now? They're like, oh yeah. And I'm like, so when you hear a prospect do that, that's what it means. So it's not on purpose. So now you, so now you know, because you just did it subconsciously. You didn't know. You didn't do it with intent. You just did it because you're trying to set up outs later. And I was like, so now you can identify that, right? They're like, yeah. And I was like, would that, would that, was that helpful to you? Would, okay, sweet. All right. Anyway, let's go back through. And then just like, it just destroys yeah, it's their like, head. It's like, it's like helping them resolve that concern before the end of the call. Yeah. And so like they don't, and they don't want to be the classic prospect, right? Like they don't, you know, all the, the best thing about salespeople is they all think that like, no, 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 just give it to me straight, man. You know, I'm an action taker. I don't, I don't, I don't mess salespeople around. If you want to get messed around by somebody, you listen to the, the guy that tells you, no, 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 I'm a straight shooter. You go, no, you're not. Man. <laughs> like I can tell you that because you said you were, that's how I know you're not. <laughs> oh, hundred percent. No, it's uh, yeah. Salespeople are a different breed, right? Because when you're asking them like certain questions, like, oh, I know what you're doing. Well, sorry, we, you know, without us finding out your situation, we're not really sure we can even help you in the first place, right? So it's like when you yeah. say those type of things, even to a salesperson, they're just like, huh? Well, yeah, because we don't know. We don't know enough about what's going on right now to see if we can even help you. What's the point? What's the best, why am I even here? You know, I've yeah. done that before on calls, you know, where the prospect is like really hesitant, like just won't give me information. And I'm just like, why am I even here? Like throw yeah. it in their face and they're just like, what do you mean? Well, I mean, it sounds like everything's going perfect for you. I mean, why, why did you even want me? I mean, why would I even be on this call with you? You don't need us. Yeah. <laughs> you know I mean? Check it back. Yeah, exactly. It, you know, it's a, 
it's so funny, man. Like there's so, so many, like it, you're always, it all kind of boils down to similar things. And I think with salespeople in particular, like, you know, they, they all like, they all have a vision of where they want to be and they all have sort of the exact same struggles of, of exactly like what's kind of stopping them from getting there because a lot of the information out there just really is like, you know, you can apply it and you can be successful with some of these selling techniques, but like you have to be a particular type of person. Yeah. Like for me, like, I think I'd be fine. Like I, like I was fine. I mean, you know, yeah. I was making 25 grand a month yeah. uh, commissions with almost no experience in the high ticket selling industry. Yeah. Right. And, and so you know, but like, and that was fine. I could have a comfortable living that way, but like, there's a lot more that you can do. And I think that a lot of people without the authority, without that sort of inbuilt sales charisma, but yeah. the NEPQ way, like the great thing about it is you can be like, basically like a tech nerd and absolutely sell the living bejesus out of it. If you have a, not a drop of charisma in your entire body. Oh, hundred percent. I mean, that's why it's duplicatable. That's why you know, when you and I go into organizations, sales organizations, and they've got 30 salespeople, they're getting every salesperson to increase sales, not just one or two, like everybody's selling more, right? Because it's duplicatable. You could be a freaking, you know, CTO, chief technology officer of a company and barely talk. And if you learn certain questions that we ask you, or that we train you in NEPQ with the right tonality that we train you, you're going to freaking outsell a Grant Cardonite disciple every day of the week. And you're yeah. like a tech nerd. I, I've seen it so many times. I, I mean, I could, I could, I could just throw testimonials out here on this thing of people who have never had any sales experience, no charisma at all, introverts who sell and make 30, 40,000 a month in commissions that outsell everybody else in their company of the most charismatic people in the company. Yeah. And that's just, it's, it's a rarity because I think a lot of the other methods, they really do require you to think very quickly on your feet, be very witty, be kind of funny, be charismatic and be like naturally authoritative, which for some people, like for me, like I'm naturally, like I like, I, I like leading conversations. It's, it's kind of how I do things naturally anyway. Yeah. But like for some people, like some of the guys on the sales, you know, on the seventh level team, like they just can't, that's just not them, but yeah. they're still killers. Yeah. You know, <laughs> you know, it's, it's really funny. I actually got a, I got a, I got a message from one of the inner circle guys, Russ, um, I don't know. He has a super interesting business model. He mitigates taxes for when people sell their business. Yeah. Um, so, so let's say you sell your business for a hundred million dollars, you might be up for $32 million in tax. Right. Yeah. And then he mitigates a lot of that through totally legal, like a hundred percent, like legit. He's just like a really good accountant. And then yeah. he takes whatever percentage of whatever tax he's saved you, he takes a percentage. Yeah. So he did like, he closed uh 6 million last week. Yeah. And then he got a message from one of his like referral partners because he pays his referral partners 50 G's, right? If you give him a referral that closes, it's $50,000 referral fee. So he has a lot of very good referral partners, right? Yeah. And the guy messaged him after us. He's like, I don't know what you did, but that dude trusts you so much. He's like, he told you about business assets that I didn't know about. And that was his accountant, right? <laughs> like he came in, he's like, I don't know what you did, but keep doing it. Like- and he was like, it's and he, NEPQ, me, like baby. Not, he goes, I've only implemented like 2% of any PQ, but he goes like, that was enough. And he was, yeah, that dude just crazy. started here three weeks ago. That's insane. Yeah. So I think, I think like, that's the, the good thing about it is if you implement it in the right way, like, cause I think we've spoken about this where you don't have to just throw everything out that's working. You yeah. can kind of like go through and have a look at the things that you think would trigger the sales resistance and like remove the negative and then insert the NEPQ stuff into that. And yeah. then once you get more comfortable with the entire structure, then kind of migrate over that. That seems to be the best way to do it. I think that's the best way. Yeah. Cause yeah. if you quit cold Turkey and you're learning, I mean, these are advanced skills. I mean, let's just, let's just be realistic. Right? These are advanced skills you're learning. These are advanced. It's not just the questions, but it's learning where to pause when you ask the question. It's learning what word in that question you're going to emphasize more with your voice, right? So there's little angles that you have to learn that you're not going to learn in three days. You know, so what we try to teach these inner circle members is keep what you're doing and then start implementing any PQ until you like make the full switch over, just like you did when you first started here, not even a year ago, dude. I mean, we're talking about 10, 11 months ago. It's just like you did. You kind of made the switch. And I think you you picked up on it pretty quickly. It makes it makes a lot of sense, right? Uh, the customers don't want to be 
talked at and sold to, but they want to be asked and understood, right? They want yeah. to buy. They want to buy. I mean, there's a reason why they respond to your ad. There's a reason why they book on your calendar. There's a reason why they're looking, right? They have problems. They're basically raising their hand in the air, like, help me, right? But it's salespeople's crappy old school uh, communication skills. And I, you know, they don't work with human behavior, right? Like my background, the only thing I'm good at is an understanding of behavioral science and human psychology, like why people make decisions to do something or not to do something. That's my background in college. Okay. So when you're, when you're using NEPQ questions that work with human behavior, it gets the prospect to pull you in, pull you in, like they're roping you in, like trying to get to you to let them buy from you. That's a good position you want to be in, you know, just like this rest guy, right? Traditional selling is basically teaching you to push. And then what do they do? When you push somebody, you push your spouse push and say, hey, you, I need you to do this. They start to push back. And selling is the same way. When you start to push, most people, unless they're a lay down sale, are going to push back. And then you have to come up with all these objection handling skills and try to win them over. And hopefully they buy and then they don't cancel within three days or something crazy. And I just like, why would you want to go through all that anxiety and pressure all the time when it's so much easier to get them to pull you in and sell themselves and never have to worry that they're ever going to want to cancel? <laughs> it's a very good point. That's you, what I got guess me you, don't, you don't know what you don't know, I guess, right? <laughs> that's exactly right. Well, I man, I think that's, I think that's good for today. Um, think uh yeah because you got to get going um in, in a few minutes but um yeah so where can people find out more about this stuff and get in contact with us and you know yeah you know uh, they, can, they can just go to our facebook group you know go to sales revolution so sales revolution with jeremy minor uh me and matt are in there all day long uh marco all these other great stars that we have just like-minded sales professionals and I typically go live about five times a week with different tips and different trainings that you'll have access to. Uh, we give out a lot of content. You know, Marco's in there, in there all the time. Like, can we give this out? Can we give this out? So just go to Sales Revolution, our Facebook group. You join for free and uh, pop in there and say hi and, uh, and start learning skills that work with human behavior. It's a lot funner to work 40 hours a week and sell twice as much as you are now or three times as much because you're going to work the same amount of hours. Why not make twice as many sales or triple your sales and make a lot more money if you have to work the same hours anyways? I mean, it doesn't make any sense. So hop in there, uh, get, you know, start learning, bring your, your, uh, your learning hat on. And we're going to, we're going to train you how to use skills that work with human beings in our day and age. Exactly. I love it. I'm all about it. Um, you know, and uh, I hope you guys enjoy this new format of the podcast. You know, me and Jeremy just kind of shooting the shit and talking sales. Um, you know, we're going to go kind of, the plan is to go kind of, you know, today was a bit broader, but kind of more in depth on particular subjects and particular parts of an EPQ. And just sort of like me as the student, you know, Jeremy as the sort of teacher, um, kind of, you know, give you guys a little bit more of an in-depth aspect of what's actually going on and how you guys can apply some of this stuff to your sales game and start making more money for free when we give you a lot of free value as good congruent salespeople, you will give us money. <laughs> That's the whole point. hundred <laughs> percent. I, you know, I, 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 uh, I, I think this is going to be a lot of fun. You know, I like, uh, shooting the breeze. And I think on, I think on some of these, we're going to give away some tactical training and specific questions they need to ask at certain times in the conversations. I know we will as, as the conversation unfolds with different topics every week. So I'm pretty dang excited. So, Tune in, uh, you're gonna learn a lot and you're gonna make more sa sales and your spouse, if you're married, is gonna really love you a lot more because you're gonna make more money for the family and if you're single, you're gonna be, you're gonna have a lot more people running after you. You're gonna, you're gonna learn how to pull, get them to pull you in rather than you exactly. trying to run after them. It's a lot easier to pick up a nice lady when you have a really nice car. <laughs> that, that's right. true, right? <laughs> All right, All right, guys, thanks for listening and uh, yeah, stay tuned for the next one and have a great day.